Chin assessment. Assessing the chin. There's a great variety of chin shapes within modern humans. This is contrasting to our ancestors within all racial groups who had very uniform chin shapes. And this variety requires a certain level of assessment. And here's a way of going about making that assessment. It can be divided between the lower lip height and the chin height. This is a relatively arbitrary position. If you have a deep mentolabial fold, then it's fairly easy to make a mark here. But some people don't have deep mentolabial folds. Some people don't have mentolabial folds at all. So this is quite obvious on some people and quite difficult to determine on others. As we have this point here, known as point B, is very dependent on the position of the lower incisors. And of course, the position of the lower incisors and the function and posture of the lower lip are very, very codependent. So the lower incisors are frequently affected by the position and function of the lower lip. Now, the protrusion of this point here, Pagonian, or the protrusion of the lip, which is that point Pagonian, this, this seems to be affected by two points. One point is the, the body of the mandible itself. Uh, within the mandible, there's a nerve running deep down inside the mandible, and that nerve seems to maintain the structure of the body of the mandible. Um, bone, particularly uh, when you, you consider from the aspect of Melvin Moss and the functional matrix hypothesis, is greatly dependent on the existence of functional structures. So the functional structures that determine where the bone is. And the core body of the mandible is determined by the nerve that runs inside it. If you look at someone who's lost all of their teeth, someone who is a dentist, when you take an x-ray, the only bit of jaw that's left is the bit around the nerve, like a wrapping around the nerve, and then where the muscles insert. And that's all that's left, because that's the only bit determined by the functional requirements so the functional matrices that exist. Now, the, the chin tip is clearly influenced by that position of the nerve, so the body of the mandible. However, this can be modified. People that have relatively incompetent lips and swing the whole of the soft tissue up, in part by using the mentalis muscle, but there are various different mentalis muscle actions that you can exhibit. But if they do this action, where they do this, that'll remove the chin point. People that do that don't have chin point. And I've treated people like that, and I've trained them to stop, and I've seen their chin point redevelop. So there does seem to be a clear assessment. It's anecdotal, but once you've seen one or two, you'd be pretty certain something's going on. Now, those two factors seem to determine the actual position of the gonium here. Yeah. Now, the position of the incisors, which is dependent on the action of that lower lip, can then determine how pronounced the gonium is compared to the lower incisors. And that gives the impression of how pronounced the chin point is. So people who have a very pronounced chin point, with the chin really sticking out, it's frequently because the lower teeth and lower lips are set back. Um, in orthodontics, we have this concept of a class one, class two, and class three. So a class one is like this, a class two is like this, and a class three is like this. And in adults, I frequently see the situation where the incisors are class two, a frank class two, often with the upper teeth, and then collapse back crowding to meet the lower incisors. When I take an x-ray and I look at them, of course this point B, which is determined on the lower incisors, is set back considerably. However, the um, chin point itself is way ahead. So although dentally and skeletally 
if you're measuring from point B, they're what we refer to as a class 2. Actually, when I look at their face in whole, begonians weigh forwards. So in fact, these individuals, you could claim skeletally that they're actually a class 1. They're a normal facial balance from modern norm. And it's just that lower lip has taken back those lower incisors, and at times the whole of the lower dental arch. And when I ask these people to swallow or make extreme facial expressions, they all seem to pull back. They've this almost strap-like lower lip, pulling back those lower incisors. And we know that when incisors erupt, or sorry, when all teeth erupt, they erupt and they march forwards. That was quite clear from Bjork's work. Bjork just looking at x-rays over a period of time as people developed. So if those teeth are going to march forwards, anything that would have prevented them from marching forwards, anything that hold them back, would have hold, held back the entire lower dental arch. So maybe some people with a class 2 dental relationship is because of his lack of forward progression of the lower teeth. And my frequent Treatment for these individuals, these adults, who have usually been told they're going to need surgery to move the whole lower, lower jaw forward and then set back the chin point, is simply to move those lower incisors forward and pop in an extra premolar. Now, I've got to control that lower lip because if I move those incisors forwards into the action zone of that bottom lip, you'll destroy the gums on those lower incisors and potentially lose those teeth. But that's changing function. Of course, if you change the function, you're changing the rules of the game. And if you're changing the rules of the game, all things are possible. Or certainly things are possible that would not be possible if you weren't changing the function and the rules of the game, posture and function. Then there's another situation where people are frank class threes. And these are people who have had this compensatory mechanism where they drop the tongue into the mandible, they hold the mandible forwards, that keeps a nice open airway and that will allow that lower jaw to move forwards. Now, in these situations, the teeth are going to try and compensate. Following the concept of the dental alveola compensatory mechanism as proposed by Benny Solo. So what's going to happen is as that bottom jaw comes forwards, the lower teeth will set back. And of course that will greatly affect the shape of the chin. And that's almost the opposite cause, but the same clinical feature, or similar clinical feature, of the class 2s with the setback lower incisors I just described. These individuals would respond very well, literally, from having the chin set back. Although, of course, it would be a great advantage to move that mandible back. Or, conversely, if they were to really focus on getting the tongue up on the roof of the mouth and they had enough space, they could move that top jaw up and forward a little bit to compensate, and that would balance a slightly forward jaw with a slightly forward upper jaw, I doubt that it can ever be back, interestingly, to give a much more harmonious facial profile. However, of course, that's not easy. Changing function and posture is never easy. And assessing chins is an important thing to do whenever you're setting out trying to diagnose an orthodontic treatment plan.